Welcome to Retire with Purpose, a show specifically designed to help you maximize your financial confidence in retirement. Casey Weed is the CEO and Chief Visionary of Howard Bailey Financial, a certified financial planner and Wall Street Journal bestselling author. He's your host on Retire with Purpose. Hey, I'm Casey Weed, and we believe in retirement strategies that are driven by meaning and purpose. Join us this week and every week as we discuss planning for your best retirement, pinpointing your purpose, building a rock solid financial plan, and unpacking trending topics that could impact your financial future. Welcome to the show. Welcome to Retire With Purpose, the science of retiring with confidence, the art of living with purpose. This is your host, Casey Weed. Joining me, as he does every week, my good friend and co-host, Marshall Johnson, is here with me. Hey, hey. And we are here to discuss retirement with you. So if you're at retirement, in retirement, near retirement, or you're just seeking that coveted job optional status, you have found yourself a home. We're going to have a wide-ranging discussion today, as we always do. We're going to cover retirement income planning. What is it? And what are your options? Are you really getting retirement income planning? Plan, or are they just throwing things at the wall? We're going to discuss Social Security, advisor compensation. We also have Dave Jetson, a financial therapist, coming on Ooh. here shortly to discuss uh, your financial therapy woes, as well as uh, couples financial therapy is what Dave Ooh, does. And we're also going to hit on a late study, the latest study from Dr. Blanchett, who is also a past podcast guest, uh, called Right Sizing Retirement. But off the top here, we're going to cover something that Marshall wanted to revisit, and I'm going to let him explain to you why. Yeah, I think it's a, a very good time to revisit uh, something that I've heard from a lot of conversations here in the last couple of weeks, couple of months, you know, COVID has forced a lot of people to contemplate retirement maybe sooner than they had expected. I'm seeing a lot of families that are pushing up retirement dates and, and there's a lot of anxiety around uh, retirement. You know, I was working with a family just this past week and, and she was really kind of distraught. She just retired after 46 years with the same employer. And she said, Marshall, it's, it's, it's a fear. I have that fear of what's next. I'm worried about this new administration. I'm worried about taxes. And she had of that a lot. She was wrapped up in the fears. And so I had to take her back. And I said, now you read Casey's book, right? You read, you read job optional and she did, but it had been a couple of years ago. And I said, you need to go back to the chapter four on income planning. And for me, this is what's going to take away that fear of what's next, that what's around the corner, what's the next administration going to do? Because a rock solid retirement plan is what's going to give you that peace of mind to live your life and spend with confidence in retirement. Yeah. I mean, without income, you don't have retirement. And yeah, there, there's 35 pages devoted to income planning in my Wall Street Journal bestselling book, Job Optional, because it really is that important in there. I walk you through from the very beginning, you know, kind of the history of retirement income planning from the old 4% withdrawal rule all the way until where we find ourselves today, which is in a dramatically different place from an income planning mm -hmm. point. You know, we're talking 50 years later uh, that we were in 50 years ago. And it's really important to not only understand, or, or I should say, have an income strategy, but understand your income strategy. And also I'd say, understand the alternatives. You will never know if you have made a good choice if you don't know what other options lie out there. Yeah, we talked about, uh, well, we talk about Steve Parrish all the time, but Steve Parrish wrote an article, I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, about income strategies and how they need to match up with your personality. And this is kind of what I was explaining uh, to Diana. I said, Diana, you know, you've got you, you're, you've got a little Gemini personality to you. You've got that one side of you that wants to make a lot of money when the market's up, but she's also got that side of her that doesn't want to lose when it's down. So we have to understand that our, our assets can be structured in such a way that we're, we're still taking growth. We're still taking risks. We're still shooting for the moon with certain assets that are not going to be used for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 potential years, but then you got to have some safety. And I explained to her sequence of withdrawal risk and protecting her first 10 years. And you kind of go through through a lot of these things in, in, in your book. Yeah, if you'd like to hear that discussion with Steve Parrish, who is a professor of finance who just stepped into retirement, he explains what type of income strategy he put in place, why he mm -hmm. used a flooring strategy, used some annuities, used some other income sources, dividend income. You know, He really created a comprehensive income strategy like we create here at Howard Bailey. Check out Retire With Purpose podcast episode 179, or you can just go to retirewithpurpose.com forward slash 179. 
and he uses a, a flooring strategy. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also discuss the segmented strategy, which is what you're discussing here. Mm -hmm. And that's the one that you know, I'm the biggest fan of is a segmented income strategy where we're protecting those first five to 10 years of your retirement with guaranteed income. Mm -hmm. So you get to retirement, you have $500,000, maybe you only need $20,000 a year to satisfy your income needs. Well, then we're going to carve out $200,000, set it aside for the next 10 years to guarantee all your income needs are taken care of. It's still growing. Okay. It's still growing sure. there. You have funds left over after that 10 year period, but it's in a guaranteed place so that, you know, no matter what happens to the other $300,000, you have time on your side to make mm -hmm. up any of those losses. When you get to retirement, we get this feeling that, Oh, I can't take any more risk anymore, but you can take risk. If you set your portfolio up correctly, if you're just using that old 4% rule, you're just Hey, I'm going to take this 500,000. I'm going to draw 4% out every year. Mm -hmm. And I hope that works out. Well, how did that feel in March of last year? You know, your 500,000 is now maybe worth, you know, three, $400,000. Did you keep taking distributions during that period of time? I bet you cut back on th some mm -hmm. things. You, I bet you cut back on expenses. And I never want to sit down with one of the families that we work with and tell them, Hey, you know, market's not doing real good. I need you to cut back and cancel the country club membership. It, it's sure. it's just not a good time to be spending on things that you really enjoy. Yeah. And, and I've had those conversations. And part of the reason why I'm sitting here today talking about income strategies is because I used to be in that accumulation world. And I used to work with the 60-40 portfolio. And when you got to retirement, you made it a little more conservative. Uh, but uh, that 40% was still uh, going to be in an asset that had risk. And so when I started managing money was in uh, the spring of 2007, right before the financial crisis began. And I saw those families, Casey, that lost significant, even conservative portfolio portfolios lost significant amounts of wealth going through the financial crisis. So to me, this was an eye-opening experience because I did have to have conversations with families that were withdrawing 4%. Well, if you lose 50% of your nest egg, now it's an 8% withdrawal. And that's where we, we just need to protect some of those early years to make sure that you don't end up like those families during the financial crisis. If you would like a comprehensive guide to income strategies and all the different tools that are out there for you to explore, we're going to give out a free copy of my book to our radio listeners today, Job Optional. Just give us a call right now, 866-482-9559, 866-482-9559. We'll send you out a free copy of my Wall Street Journal bestseller, Job Optional, to walk you through all these different income strategies. So we talked about flooring strategies. We talked about segmented risk. Uh, but you know what, Casey, there's a fair amount of people that come in and say, you know, I, it, it, do, it wasn't this complicated for my parents. You know, my dad worked so many years at Harvester, whatever it was, and he got a pension and they didn't have to build a strategy and they didn't have to have ladders and segments and leg one and leg two. You know, that pension generation kind of had it easy in the sense that they put in their time, they worked hard and then the pension took care of them. But mm -hmm. in today's environment, what do you say to those, those folks that say, well, can I, can I build something like what my yeah. parents had? Well, Steve Parrish would tell you that you go ahead and create your own pension. You can create your own pension today. Uh, there are tools out there that can give you a guaranteed income for the rest of your life. And that's what he did. You know, he used a flooring strategy where he said, okay, uh, I, I'm going to spend $6,000 a month. Now, mm -hmm. I say what, what Steve did was he guaranteed his 6,000 a month for the rest of his life. He carved out a portion of his portfolio to have that guaranteed forever. So he can spend every single month. My dad did the same thing, mm -hmm. you know, however, he gave up a lot of growth potential or flexibility in doing so. And usually what a flooring strategy would be. And he says this, he says, I really overinsured my retirement, but mm -hmm. he said, I, I don't really care. I'm not trying to leave a bunch of money behind. I just wanted to know mm -hmm. that I can spend and enjoy my retirement. That's what I saved for in the first place. And it seems like it gets kind of twisted. Like that's what your grandparents did, right? That's what your parents or your grandparents right, did that had right. pensions. They weren't really worried about anything but their income every single month for the rest of their lives. They weren't thinking about you. Okay. In a large part, they weren't thinking yeah. about what they were going to leave behind or if they were going to preserve some kind of principle to leave behind. They just wanted that income forever. And that's what he did. A lot of folks will come to us and say, you know, I just want to know that I'm going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And then I'll take some risk with those things that are maybe extras. They're bonuses, right? Maybe the country club membership, or maybe it's the annual vacation you take the family on and you would say, well, I'm spending 6,000 a month. I can't afford to live without 4,000 a month. So with social security, I've got 2,000 a month in social security. I'm going to carve out 
you know, maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars in my portfolio to guarantee that gap. So now I know I'm going to have 4000 a month forever. The other 2000 we're going to generate interest and dividends uh, mm-hmm. from the portfolio to cover those expenses, knowing that dividends get cut sometimes, knowing that interest rates go down sometimes. We're going to take that risk because we're willing to be a little bit more flexible on that side. Steve actually wrote an article on that very topic, you know, how your income strategy needs to fit your personality. Right. And I think he brought up two really good points there. One, it's customizable. And I think that's a big deal here is, is people that are trying to build a retirement income plan that suits their personality and suits their needs. Well, you need to go through the pros and the cons, and you need to understand these different strategies and what's going to provide you with the most peace of mind and, and choose that strategy. But I think being able to customize, that means you need to get the education. And I think that's what a great thing uh, your book does, Casey, is it gives that education, gives a framework. And then you can pick up the phone and give us a call if you want to dig in deeper, because it is something that needs to be customized to each and every family. Yeah. And that's because we, we you, you might be surprised to find under the income planning segment, I've got tax planning in there. I uh, also have social security planning in there. Uh, you might think that, well, this is the social security amount I get. I just press start and that's what I get and that's the end. But we walk you through really understanding social security so that you can put more money to your bottom line in retirement, but also tax planning. And if you're able to reduce Uncle Sam's cut, that gives you more money that you can spend every single month. This is why you have to incorporate your tax planning, your social security planning, your pension planning with your investment planning because all of these things go hand in hand you have to be able to see the big picture. If you can't see the big picture where you stand today, you're not sure if you're going to be okay no matter what happens next in the market, then it's time to pick up the phone, give us a call, let us put together an income strategy for you. 866-482-9559. We'll do a complimentary consultation to structure an income strategy customized to you. That's 866-482-9559. And maybe you're not ready to take that leap. Maybe you're a little further out from retirement. You're not ready to implement an income strategy, but you are ready to get a good education about all of the options that are out there. You know, when I, when I wrote this book, I wrote this book because I had read so many garbage financial books over the years that were only trying to sell whatever that person was trying to sell, whatever they had in their toolbox that they could put in front of you. That's what they were going to sell on. And they were going to sell away from everything else. I wanted to give you a real education, a manual that you could open up and get an unbiased view of all the different tools that are out there, whether that's stocks, whether that's ETFs, whether that's mutual funds, whether that's annuities or life insurance, long-term care insurance, Medicare. I wanted you to have all of that right in front of you so that you could make the decision given the right education on what's best for you. And if you'd like to get a free copy of my book, Job Optional, and start that journey, then give us a call at 866-482-9559, 866-482-9559, and we will put a free copy of that book in your hands. Now, I want to ask our question of the day. Our question of the day is this. As of 2019, what was the collective amount of debt owed by Americans in their 60s? Nine million? Three billion, eight billion, two trillion. We'll have the answer when we come back. First time callers are eligible to receive one in stock book per request. Limit one book per week for household up to three books per calendar year. See full terms at howardbailey.com slash terms. You're listening to Retire with Purpose, hosted by Casey Weed and Marshall Johnson. This is Retire With Purpose, hosted by Casey Weed and Marshall Johnson. Welcome back to Retire With Purpose, the science of retiring with confidence, the art of living with purpose. I am your host, Casey Weed. Joining me, my good friend and co-host, Marshall Johnson, to answer our question of the day. As of 2019, what was the collective amount of debt owed by Americans in their 60s? Oof. Was that $9 million, $3 billion, $8 billion, $2 trillion? Oh, stop. Stop it. <laughs> Do I have to put the little pinky up like Mike Myers and Austin Powers when I say $2.1 trillion? Woo! That is a whole lot of debt. That's Two a t- t- trillion dollars. Capital T. Yeah, I think you know. Quite often, we're so focused on government debt and the media kind of miss out that there's a tremendous amount household of debt. household debt you know owned out there at the same times. And individuals in their sixties, two trillion, 
70 somethings, $1.1 trillion. And in a good portion, you know, that's that's going to be mortgages. But what's been a, a huge boon to that is low interest rates. I mean, with interest rates as low as they are, it's kind of hard not to take the debt, right? right. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean that's a bad decision either. Uh, there is There are arguments that could be made either way. Uh, and I really encourage you to check out our podcast. We talk extensively about mortgages, refinances, retirement with debt. Uh, we've covered it with um, members of the Dave Ramsey Solutions team. Uh, we've covered it with real estate experts. Check out the Retire with Purpose podcast, retirewithpurpose.com. Uh, now it's our turn to turn the mic over to you and see what's on your mind. So we get questions all week long, uh, and people go on over to retirewithpurpose.com. In the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, it says, Ask Casey a Question. Just type your question right in there. It comes over to us. People do this all week long, and then we select a few of those questions to feature right here on the show. So if you have something that's keeping you up at night, you have questions about your financial strategy, maybe you have some basic finance questions you just want to get answered, you're arguing with your neighbor, your financial advisor, go to <laughs> retirewithpurpose.com, type your question in there. And if you would like it to be featured, Featured here, uh, we'll get approval from you. We'll feature that question right here on the show. We got a question from Raymond in Fort Wayne, who says, "I'm doing my research on the best way to prepare for retirement. I've met with two different firms so far. One suggested annuities, and the other told me to stay away. Can you comment?" <laughs> yeah, we could probably comment for quite a while, Ray. But hey, the bottom line is that's a great, great question. You said, how can I best prepare for retirement? So uh, to me, if, if I'm in your shoes, what I want to think deeply about is what are my concerns? What are my challenges? What are my problems? What are the things that may be keeping uh, you or your spouse up at night? And what are you trying to solve? I think that's the most important thing before meeting with a financial advisor of any sort. Why do you need them? What are they going to accomplish for you? And maybe if it's just getting a general sense of where you're at and how you're doing, you know, shows like this, doing doing exactly what you're doing, meeting with a couple of different advisors. But I think it's really helpful to know what is it that you're looking to get out of this experience. Yeah, I think what you said there, you know, really hits home for me. Uh, I recently finished Annie Duke's book, uh, How to Decide. Oh, yeah. And, you know, she, she is uh, a an expert decision scientist, mm -hmm. uh, also, you know, a multi-million dollar winner in the World Series of Poker, right? And After she learned how to make the decisions, then she became the poker champion, Yeah, right? she collected good information first. And one of the things she said in there is you have to be very clear on what your values are before you seek advice. Uh, and you have to know what the values are of the individual that you're seeking advice from. So get clear on those values first. That'll help direct you which direction, direction you should go and get educated about all the different tools that are out there and how they can possibly be used. You could do that by picking up my book, Job Optional, where I walk you through all the different types of annuities and also to all the different market-based solutions. Uh, give us a call now. We're, we're going to send it out to you for free. 866-482-9559. 866-482-9559. We'll put the book in your hands. And then there's another element that I also cover in the book, and that is your advisor's background. You want to know where that information is coming from. Check your sources, as Steve Parrish shared with us during our, our our discussion on the podcast, he said, always check your sources. I, what I often find is those individuals that are against something, it's because they can't they can't do it, right? You know, if you walk into a Jeep dealership, they're not going to pitch you uh, on a Chrysler. Well, yeah, I guess they would here in, in Fort Wayne, but they're sure. not going to pitch you on a Mercedes. They're yeah, not going to pitch exactly. you on a Lexus mm -hmm. or they're going to pitch you on a Toyota, right? Those are bad solutions. Or they might say, well, that's okay, but ours is better, we can right? Better. We can do sure. better. You, know, you want to know what tools they have in the first place. If they can't use annuities, then well, why are you going there in the first place and taking that advice when they don't have all the tools to solve all your different needs, I think you should always be presented with more than one plan preferably three general plans on the front end. Uh, and if we're talking about annuities, we're talking about retirement income strategies, or we should be. Uh, that's where annuities really play a role is when we're trying to create guaranteed lifetime income streams or guaranteed income streams over a period of time for that matter. And we always present a market-based solution, right? There's a market-based solution. There's a hybrid solution. There's, a, there's an alternative solution that's guaranteed for a lifetime, right? You, you have the ability to work with an advisor that's truly independent that isn't only securities licensed where they go, well, annuities are bad because I can't do them. Well, they're probably not going to say that, sure. but that's what they might say. It, 
You have something to add? Well, no, I was just going to say about your point to values, you know, the understanding where the values of your advisor are. Well, he may not value annuities for one reason or another, but it's good to know where they stand and why they stand that way and see if they can make a, make a case for it. But understanding that value systems in products are not inherently one and the same to, to say that stocks aren't good or bad or annuities are not good or bad. Those are not inherent qualities. They're just tools. Mm -hmm. And for you to understand how the tools work and apply those to your value system and what you're trying to create, I think is, is a two part answer. Well, and I'd like to jump, I think this ties in really well to Lewis's question from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Lewis said, can you explain the difference between a fee-based advisor and a fee only oh, advisor? Look at you, look at you so jumping ahead. It ties here. in really well because you know a fee only advisor is a securities only licensed advisor that can only receive compensation based on fees that they charge, mm -hmm. right? They can't receive commissions. And so that means they can't use 99.99% of annuity products that are out there. There are a couple fee only annuities mm -hmm. available today, but they don't stand up to the commission-based sure. annuities today. Mm -hmm. You could go out and get a commission-based annuity that's significantly better than a fee-only annuity that's available today. You're going to get more guaranteed income. You're going to get greater participation in market gains. And that's just simply the world that we live in today. So if you're working with a fee-only advisor that doesn't have a good annuity solution, of course, they're going to say annuities are bad. You know, We should do a bond strategy mm -hmm. or a bond ladder or, or take a different approach. With a fee-based advisor, so we are a fee-based advisor, and that means that we are fee-based. So if we are managing money, uh, just like the fee-only advisor, if we're managing money and taking risk with that money, so if we're buying and selling stocks, stocks or bonds, ETFs, mutual, mutual funds, funds, bonds, yeah. options, you know, if we're getting into that realm of risk, then we have a fiduciary responsibility that is aligned with a fee. If your portfolio grows, we make more money. If it goes down in value, we make less money, right? So we have, our goals are aligned. We don't want you to lose. We want you to make more. Mm -hmm. I think that's the only way to have somebody take risk with your money. And that's the way the majority of advisors are going today. Right. I, now, the fee based means that, yes, we base our structure and our compensation around that fee, but we have the ability to utilize insurance solutions. So we can take care of your life insurance. We can take care of your annuity solutions. We can take care of your long-term care solutions, your Medicare solutions. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get a truly comprehensive plan that is unbiased if you're working with a fee-only advisor because that excludes them from 99.9% percent of insurance-based solutions. So do you think you're going to get pitched a Jeep when you walk into the Mercedes dealer? Sure. It goes back to that analogy. Yeah. So understanding, you know, fee-based versus fee-only, very big distinction. And you're going to see people pound their chest on both sides going, hey, we're fee-only. It's the only way you got to go. And, and, and I started my career as fee-only. And uh, what I began to realize, and I told some of this story earlier, is going through the financial crisis, realizing that there was tools that weren't in my toolbox. And my grandfather was a carpenter and taught me, you know, as a little kid, I see all these saws of different shapes and sizes, like, Grandpa, why do you need so many saws? He's like, well, it's different tools for different jobs. And so I quickly realized that there's a lot of tools out there in the financial services. And, and if I'm going to go through an 08 or a financial crisis again, I want to make sure I have all the tools at my disposal. So that's when I made the shift to fee-based versus fee-only. But you need to understand those things that some people don't advertise them and, and understand what makes the most sense for your situation. Yeah. If you don't have all the tools, you're inherently biased. Uh, you don't have the ability to approach every situation in an unbiased way. Our last question here comes from Patricia in Granger. She says, can I start my social security benefits while I'm still earning income? Absolutely, Patty. In Granger, you can definitely earn some income when you start Social Security. But the big distinction here is whether you waited till your full retirement age to start Social Security, or maybe you started it early, say 62 or 63. If you start Social Security early, there is going to be an earnings limit. And if you exceed that, there's going to be a reduction in your benefits. So typically somebody starting Social Security early in 2021, they're going to be limited by $18,940. If you've exceeded full retirement age based upon the uh, Social Security Administration's definition, then you can pretty much make as much as you want. Yeah, I'm going to bump it up by 20 bucks. In 2021, it's 18960 
crazy. In the year of your social security age, it's 50250 But Oh, there yeah, you go. Making money is always a good thing. So Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, if you are 62 and you start your social security, my dad and I had this you know, a lot of financial advisors don't mm-hmm. get this either. My dad was an advisor for 40 years and he's asking me, should I take social security or not? He's 62. He goes, but if I take it and I decide I want to make money, then I have to give it back. I'm like, yes, but then they will give it back to you in the future because yes, you have to pay it back, but it's really just a forced suspension of your benefits. It's like you never took it. And so then you get to benefit from delayed retirement credits. So now if you file at 62 and you made 50 grand, you have to pay it back at 63. Let's say that you're back under the earnings limit. You can take your social security in, they're going to bump it up by 8% in that year. So you're going to make it back over time. It's not like they're really just ripping it out of your pocket. You're never going to see it again. It's really just like you never took it in the first place. But this was what makes social security so complex. And this is why we specialize in social security. This is why I went and achieved my retirement income certified professional designation, because this is such an important part of your retirement income strategy. And we're offering a complimentary financial review right now for you to meet with an independent financial advisor on our team, either in person or through a video meeting from the comfort of your home, where we're going to help you determine how prepared you are to handle retirement pitfalls like inflation, healthcare emergencies, stock market crashes, even taxation. In short, we'll take the guesswork out of financial planning for you. And it can take just 30 minutes. So right now, Give us a call at 866-482-9559 for a comprehensive financial review at no obligation, 866-482-9559. Stick around because up next, we have licensed professional financial therapist at Jetson Counseling, Dave Jensen, jumping in. First-time callers are eligible to receive one in-stock book per request. Limit one book per week per household up to three books per calendar year. See full terms at howardbailey.com slash terms. You're listening to Retire With Purpose, hosted by Casey Weed and Marshall Johnson. This is Retire With Purpose, hosted by Casey Weed and Marshall Johnson. Welcome back to Retire With Purpose, the science of retiring with confidence, the art of living with purpose. This is your host, Casey Weed. Joining me, my good friend and co-host, Marshall Johnson, and another very special guest. We have Dave Jetson joining us. Dave is a licensed professional therapist in his practice, Jetson Counseling, and is one of approximately 12 financial therapists in the entire country. 12? 12. There's, like, there's only 12. There's a dozen of these guys, right? So we're lucky we, we were able to get connected with Dave. Uh, in his role, he helps others explore and heal money issues through his financial recovery program, mm. which was created to help clients better better understand the deeper underlying motivations that cause them to interact with money in different fashions and provide them freedom and ability to make healthier choices around their finances. Dave joined us on the podcast to discuss the concept of financial therapy, financial counseling, uh, couples financial counseling, the benefits of having a financial therapist, and how to set financial barriers with those you care about. That was actually where I was originally introduced to Dave was one of our weekend reading for retirees article that had had to do with creating healthy financial barriers mm-hmm. for your loved ones or your friends for that matter. Sure. I, and that was part of our weekend reading for retirees. If you want to sign up to get that email, it's retirewithpurpose.com. You can also get a link to that article and listen to the full length discussion there, retirewithpurpose.com forward slash 213. This is episode 213 with Dave Jetson. And we kicked off our discussion with just better understanding financial therapy, who needs a financial therapist? And should your financial advisor be your financial therapist or should there be a separation of those two different worlds? Well, that's that's a very hot topic in this organization. I mean, in, in the respect that, uh, you know, when we look at it, when we're doing the financial planning piece, you're actually using one por- portion of your brain. It's more of your, your conscious brain and your logical brain, if you will. And so, so the Financial planners use that very well. The emotional brain is tapping more into the subconscious. And what we're going to be doing is tapping more into your emotional history patterns, into 
traumas that you may have had, your belief systems that you were taught from your parents with words, actions, inactions, many different ways. And so it's really about, it's, it, it's it, tapping into different types of brains. And so recommended is, is you have your financial planner and you have your financial therapist. I actually have worked with some financial planners where I'll sit in on the financial planning sessions in order to be able to help bring, glean out the emotional uh, piece of, of what's going on. A good example I had is one financial planner is working with this couple for oh, about seven years, he said, and he says, we're getting nowhere. And I says, well, you know, so I got invited in. In a two-hour session, what I was able to do is help them see that they're saying the same thing but in a, from an emotionally different platform that got them to be able to come to a re resolution. And so that's the piece of what financial therapy brings to the table is that e emotional connection and help see what's really driving the energy. This is such an important topic. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I love thinking about emotions and finances, just the oh, connection so between the two. Yeah. Uh, right now, I'm reading God and money, and it's really amazing to see what the Bible says about money. People mm -hmm. talk about the Bible says you need to pray. Well, there's only like 400 verses that say you should focus on prayer, uh, where there's 2,000 different positions in the Bible which are taken on geared towards, uh, geared towards money mm -hmm. and wealth like the I mean God knew this was an important topic right that wow. this isn't just about you know and, and I think a lot of our emotions that come out of those teachings or the way we misconstrued what we thought we read or what our parents taught us sure. what our pastor sure. taught us you know we get kind of uh, jerked over pardon my language you know in that respect over time and then we end up in an unhealthy place with where we have an mm -hmm. unhealthy relationship with money out of all those experiences that right. could could have happened in any facet of your life well it's like tim ferris we talked about uh on our previous show about how single ply you know he grew up very poor and they were very frugal and he's carried you know the single ply mentality in several areas of our of his life going forward and realizing that it was necessary at one point in time, but today it's, it's not necessary anymore. And I think we carry this baggage with us at all times, whether we know it or not. So I love that he touched on the subconscious because I have many conversations with individuals where I can sympathize with his story. They're like, I don't feel like I'm getting anywhere. Like we're not speaking the same language. And I think that's very true. And we have to realize that he said actions and inactions. And I think that is a great concept and realizing when somebody's not acting or they're using an inaction they're using it for a reason whether it's for pr protection or motivation there's 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 the psychology behind it all and it's also in, intriguing we all know a tightwad right we all know someone that's not frugal you know they're cheap right they're spending money <laughs> poorly and if you know somebody like that pass on episode 190 of the retire with purpose podcast uh, where we dive deep into that issue. So going back to Dave Jetson here, licensed financial therapist, uh, he conducts a lot of financial recovery workshops. And I wanted to ask him, what would you say is one of the most noteworthy takeaways from conducting those workshops? I will tell you that I work with people and I will invite them to create a, a definite, you know, share their definitions of money. And I usually at a typical workshop will get 50 to 70 definitions. None of them are the real definition of what money actually is. And, and every one of them has an emotional component associated with them. So I'm very interested in who's saying what, you know, what definition they have for money because it's, it's, it's creating a, an emotional right. definition around what they have. And so in that, that's what we're going to want to work on in the workshop is their emotional de definition of money. And based upon that, is what, what we'll do is I might incorporate certain money, real money exercises to help them feel that pattern and then help dig into the emotional historical pattern associated with it. And, and you know, what's interesting is, is, is I invite people to look at their first memory of money. And many people bring up, you know, where there's actual money involved. Sometimes they don't. And many of our money financial patterns were not created with actual money. It was about there was value in something, in a situation that they felt value or felt value being taken away from them. And those are the patterns that we really want to dig into and look at to explore how those patterns 
created their financial patterns. I always ask that question at our events. Anytime I'm at a, speaking to a group, I'll say, you know, what, what does money mean to you? You know, what, what does retirement mean to you? And yeah, those two th- questions I think are both very important. What does money sure. mean to you? Very yeah. important. But mm-hmm. then what does retirement mean to you? And it shouldn't mean money, right? And yet you're sitting here listening to us talk about money. You know, that, that probably means there's a problem. That probably means there's something that needs to be corrected, either through financial therapy or financial planning. And if you want to start going down that road, give us a call, 866-482-9559, 866-482-9559. Now, I came into contact with Dave, again, through one of his articles on setting healthy financial boundaries. And we got into that discussion deeply uh, throughout our conversation here. And what he's going to share with us here is really asking a great question. You know, what are you teaching your children by giving them money? It's really about inviting them to look at what are you teaching? And this is where I will typically work on with a person. What are you teaching by giving your grandchild this money? What are the lessons? And, and, and many, when we look at, well, I'm teaching them to love. And I said, well, yeah, there's truth in that. Mm-hmm. I'm teaching them uh, that they matter to me. Yeah. How about this? You notice how you're also teaching them that they don't have to take care of themselves. Are you going to be here to take care of them after you die? Because the more you enable them now, the less tools you're giving them to take care of themselves when you're gone. So let's look at the whole picture and look, look at the emotional piece of this. Is this money about giving to them really about them or is it about you? I've worked with many people when, you know, the, the, the kids in this situation that have much resentment of their parents because they haven't been taught how to manage their money, how to take care of themselves. Because mom or dad is always there to bail them out. And then when mom and dad set a limit with them, then they get really upset. And because they've learned if they get upset, they can get convinced mom and dad to give them money. Well, if you're having this issue or you think someone is, I'd check out episode number 213 of the Retire With Purpose podcast. And I'm just going to leave that one right there. Uh, and let's transition over to your spouse. And what about setting healthy financial boundaries with your spouse? Let's see what Dave Jensen has to say. So it's really about looking at the details with that couple, if you will, very specifically and saying what, as far as if we want to work on the boundaries and that sort of thing, What's the emotions associated with this? You know, where's where's the fear and the anxiety? Okay, for the the person that's saving, many times I'm afraid. You know, money is about safety and security. So you're throwing away my safety and security. And for the other person, you know, the uh, this person is spending all the money. It, it it's it's uh, really about. I have to spend it while I have it because it's going to be taken away from me. Money is about freedom and love and joy and that sort of thing. And so it's really about how do we set a boundary of saying, you know, the boundary could be about an allowance, you know, in that case. Really great conversation. I I see couples struggle with this conversation exactly when he said, look, money to me means safety and security, and you're throwing away my safety and security. So having those difficult conversations with somebody that understands this dynamic, I think is really important. Yeah. uh, Hard questions are asked throughout that interview. And we've got a special offer for you today. We partnered up with Dave Jetson to offer his latest book to you. It's called Setting True Boundaries, How to Create Respect, Safety, and Freedom in Relationships. And it's free to you right here, right now. In this book, you're going to learn all about how boundaries with consequences create trust and respect, leading to less tension and above all, a stronger relationship. We have a stack of these books over here and we're going to give them away until they're all gone. And to claim your free copy of Setting True Boundaries, contact our team now by calling 866-482-9559, 866-482-9559, Or you can email us at info at howardbailey.com. Stick around because when we come back, we're going to be discussing an article from the Financial Planning Association, Right Sizing Your Retirement. 
First-time callers are eligible to receive one in-stock book per request. Limit one book per week per household up to three books per calendar year. See full terms at howardbailey.com slash terms. You're listening to Retire With Purpose, hosted by Casey Weed and Marshall Johnson. This is Retire With Purpose, hosted by Casey Weed and Marshall Johnson. Welcome back to Retire With Purpose, the science of retiring with confidence, the art of living with purpose. This is your host, Casey Weed. Joining me, my good friend and co-host, Marshall Johnson. Hey, hey. Here with me. And this is our opportunity to cover one of the four articles that we sent out this past Friday as part of our weekend reading for retirees email series. What is that? Well, you'd know if you signed up. Go to retirewithpurpose.com. Check out weekend reading. First name and email. We'll get you signed up to receive four articles every single Friday on trending topics in the retirement planning space. The latest research, uh, the latest in income strategies, the latest investment strategies, tax strategies sent directly to your inbox with commentary from myself. We're also summarizing those for you so you don't have to read a 30-page white paper Woo. unless you want to dive in a little bit deeper. And we're going to be covering one of those articles here with you, which comes from the Financial Planning Association, and it is titled Right Sizing Retirement. And it is a, an academic page. white paper, about 30 yeah. pages long. <laughs> and this is why we not only touch on it here on the radio show, but we do a full-length discussion over on the podcast. You can check that out at retirewithpurpose.com, where you can also get a link to this article while you're listening to the full-length conversation. This one comes to us uh, written and really contributed to largely uh, by Dr. David Blanchett, yes. uh, who's also he's a chartered financial analyst, a certified financial planner, but CFA, uh, yeah, PhD, all and, around really smart guy. Yeah, he, he was actually um, joined us on the Retire with Purpose podcast. Boy, uh, back in lifetime 2019, ago. I think, episode 55 of the podcast. You can get that at retirewithpurpose.com forward slash 55. And that was largely focused on his research around inflation in retirement and if that is a real problem. What kind of inflation rate assumption should you be using mm -hmm. uh, in the retirement plans that you put together? That was some of his just landmark research that has had a huge impact in the industry for those that pay attention. And well, this and, is, and to say that he writes for this article was published for financial advisors and financial mm -hmm. planners and geared. That's why it's academic. That's why it's so large. But we think this is useful information to to, oh. to transcribe to you so you can understand the, the science around retirement. And that's a big part of what we're talking about here, math and science. Exactly. Uh, this article is titled Right Sizing Retirement, uh, and it is an academic article. And I just want to start off with, hey, this is my biggest takeaway here. This is furthering his research into retirement spending and just putting another nail in it and saying, hey, you're doing it wrong. You know, many advisors, almost, probably every single online financial calculator I've ever seen, they're doing it wrong, right? And, and the, the biggest takeaway here is that financial planners need to reconsider the assumptions that they're making about spending in retirement, specifically the first 10 years of retirement, assuming that spending increases annually in retirement is mm -hmm. false. That is not the reality. Even after you factor in inflation, spending declines in retirement. And we've shared this in a simple format, which is the go-go years, the slow-go years, and the no-go years, mm -hmm. right? We, we start our retirement. We're ready to get ripping and roaring. We're taking vacations, enjoying the, the golf the course and the grandkids. And yeah. then we get in our slow-go years. We've kind of settled into it, and now we're kind of in a, a normalized spending pattern. Uh, but we're slowing down a little bit. You know, maybe we're not taking a, as many trips. We don't have two homes. We don't have two cars. We get into those no-go years, and now maybe we're not driving. You know, maybe we have someone not like my grandfather yeah, in his mid 90s who's right. who's not driving and is also not spending a lot of time out of 
the house. He doesn't eat hardly anything, which grandpa, if you're <laughs> listening, I hope you are eating well today. Yeah, but that has resulted in a reduction in spending. And that is the reality of spending patterns in retirement. Doesn't matter who you are, you have go, go, slow, go, and no go years in retirement that affects your spending patterns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think this is such a great article because we see it firsthand. You know, I've, I've worked with families. I can think of one family in particular who I've worked with for nearly 15 years. They've been in retirement for 25 years. Heck, they were 10 years into retirement before I met them. And they still, you know, take the similar withdrawals that they took 25 years ago. They're still not spending it. They're accumulating more and more in the bank every year. And mm -hmm. you would assume by most models that their expenses would be almost twice as high today than they were when they started retirement. But that's mm -hmm. just not what we see in practice. And what it's that not can the reality. What that can lead to is some people drastically underspending. And it kind of brings us back to my big takeaway here is why save it if we're not gonna spend it? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I do go back to those families that I know we've been, been working with for over 20 years that are spending today less than they were spending 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. You factor in a 3% annual inflation increase. I mean, compound that, but without compounding, I mean, their expenses should go up 60% sure. with compounding. They should double over 20 years. And that's what you see from most retirement planners. If that has you discouraged, check out the research because the, the research does not back up factoring an annual increase in inflation, let alone the experiences. I can't tell you a single family that we work with that is spending more today than they did a decade ago. And that's where this study largely focuses its time. It says in the study, it shows that 75% of households decline spending in real terms over the first 10 years of retirement. That means after factoring in inflation, you know, the, the average house, the 75% of households are spending less 10 years into retirement than when they started retirement. Mm -hmm. And 23% is the average total reduction. I find that number very interesting. Why? Because that's about 2% a year. Yeah, that's a year, yeah. roughly the inflation rate we've been seeing over the last decade. So uh, the, the, the research doesn't really explain why we're seeing an average you know, adjustment of about 2% a year in declines in spending for mm -hmm. retirees. I, I see that kind of as, well, I'm going to continue to spend the same and I'm adjusting myself for inflation. So every year I'm spending a little bit less because I've experienced a little bit of inflation. So I'm not yeah, overall spending more. Yeah. Now this is on average, right? Well, and you talk about that, that right sizing, we're going to get more into it, but you, you know, when, when the paychecks stop coming in psychologically, there is an effect there where individuals feel like, boy, I don't want to dip into the retirement funds just yet, or I don't want to I don't want to see a decline in my account values or my household net worth year over year. And that can cause problems. I mean, it can, yeah. it can lead to situations where you're drastically underspending or under You're just not enjoying life. Yeah. I mean, this is why we invited on financial therapist Dave Jetson to the Retire With Purpose yes, podcast. You can check great. that out at mm -hmm. our, our Facebook page. It's live right now. Howard Bailey Financial's Facebook page, Dave Jetson. That'll be episode 213 of the Retire With Purpose podcast. We talk exactly about that issue, our money issues, you know, the things that are holding back ourselves from being able to fully enjoy our retirement. So the article focuses on this retirement consumption gap. So Marshall, what is this retirement consumption gap? Yeah, Casey, I mean, I guess boiling it down, it's it's not spending as much as you possibly could have to maximize your retirement. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you know, well-funded households, so these are households that are fully funded for retirement. They got more money than they need. It's about 18% of the study. And Which is a small number. Well, right? as the, of those well-funded households, over the first 10 years of retirement, they have 29% of them have more wealth 10 years in retirement than when they started, but spending hasn't increased. Mm -hmm. They have significantly more wealth, but spending hasn't increased. I also think it's interesting that 54% have funded ratios that increase over the first 10 years, and spending doesn't increase for those individuals either. So 54% of households in this study have the ability to actually enjoy a great retirement 10 years into retirement and yet they're not spending any more than when they started. They have a heck of a lot more money than when they started relative to how much they spend, but they're not actually increasing their spending. So the question is, why is that? And and what David Blanchett points to here in the article is largely what he calls right-sizing retirement, right. where retirees are actively deciding to spend less early in retirement to right-size spending with what they have saved to prolong what little resources they have available. So we're trying to 
get right, right? We might start out in retirement where, well, we only have 30% of what we actually need. And what was really interesting around that group, individuals that have 35% of what they actually need on average increase what they need 10 years into retirement to 84%. 35% of what I need, 10 years into retirement, I've got 84% of what I need, and I continue to spend to the way I did. You know, on I, I didn't, I'm not spending any more, even though I have significantly more available assets to spend. Fully funded households as a whole. So those individuals that are in retirement, we share that about 18% of them are actually able to have more money than they need in retirement. That number goes from 18 to 48% over 10 years. So 10 years into retirement, half of individuals have a fully funded retirement, but at the beginning, only 18% yeah. have a fully funded retirement. I mean, I think that's astounding. And I think it's, it should give you a, a ray of hope. It should make you feel better because all that we're heard over and over again is we're, you know, people, there's a retirement crisis and people haven't saved enough. But what this study is showing is 10 years into retirement, most of these demographics are in better shape than they were at the start of retirement. You've talked a lot about funded ratio, and I think that's a, he gives the, um, the calculation, but basically just adding up all your sources of income, Social Security, pension, uh, multiplying it by the effective tax rate and dividing it by your consumption. There you can find out on a ratio. If you're one and above, you have a funded or overfunded retirement. And and it's great to have little calculations like that. You know, and it it might've been hard to follow uh, Marshall and write that down while you're driving down the road. So if you want us to run that calculation for you, give us a call at 866-482-9559, 866-482-9559. Now, I think here are three reasons that are mainly cited for individuals not spending more when they could in retirement. They are in a position where they have a consumption gap. They could spend more money. One could be they want to leave a bequest. They want to leave money to someone when they die. Mm -hmm. Uh, They have of uncertainty around medical expenses, or they have an uncertainty with their life expectancy. But what was actually found is, I mean, only 25% actually have the motive to leave money behind. Uh, most retirees won't actually face sky high medical bills and self-insuring is suboptimal. So you could solve the medical problem with insurance, uncertainty and life expectancy. Well, you could actually uh, resolve that through the use of guaranteed income products. Mm-hmm. So you can have guaranteed income taken care of, you get your medical expenses covered, and most people don't have a goal to leave money. Money. So I think my favorite point here is that individuals prefer to have stable lifestyles versus volatile lifestyles. We just naturally psychologically gravitate towards spending the same amount to maintain the same amount of lifestyle throughout our lives. You know, on your way to retirement, you have scrimped or pinched your pennies. You've lived a certain way. You don't just step into retirement. Now you've got more than you need. And now you end up living like Donald Trump. You know, you don't start flying around in private planes or wearing fancy clothes if you didn't grow up that way. I think that's probably the most likely reason that individuals are not spending as much as they could in retirement. And if you do feel like you're pinching pennies in retirement, then maybe you don't need to. Maybe someone has made some poor assumptions in your retirement plan and hasn't really taken into consideration the latest in retirement research, but that's what we're here for. Give us a call right now to meet with an independent financial advisor on our team, either in person or through a video meeting from the comfort of your home, and we'll work you through all the potential retirement pitfalls you might face. In short, we'll take the guesswork out of financial planning for you. It can take just 30 minutes. So give us a call right now at 866 866- 482-9559, 866-482-9559 for a comprehensive financial review at no obligation. We'll catch you right back here next week on Retire With Purpose. You've been listening to Retire With Purpose, hosted by Casey Weed and Marshall Johnson. Investment advisory services offered through Howard Bailey Securities, LLC, a registered investment advisor. Working with Howard Bailey Securities, LLC, cannot guarantee investment success or that specific financial goals will be achieved. Certified Financial Planner Board of Standards, Inc. owns the certification marked CFP and Certified Financial Planner in the U.S., which it awards to individuals who successfully complete CFP Board's initial and ongoing certification requirements. Howard Bailey Financial is a registered trademark of Howard Bailey Financial. All rights reserved. Information is not intended to provide specific legal or tax advice. Howard Bailey Financial nor its advisors are qualified to give tax or legal advice. You are encouraged to consult with your tax or legal professional for guidance on your individual situation. This radio show is a paid placement.